Broadcasting from the stages of London, this is Musical Talk, the UK's first independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, welcome to episode 55 of Musical Talk. Sitting opposite me is Paul Keeve. Hello. Hello there. You are a magician. An Ill- illusion- illusionist. An is how illusionist. I like to describe myself, yes. A Guinness World Record. Uh, <laughs> a writer. A performer. A few other things, too. What other things? <laughs> I'm a tango dancer as well, oh. actually. Yeah. Not a brilliant one, but I enjoy it. It's not on your website. <laughs> no, it's not on my website. I don't do that professionally. <laughs> I can't dance at all, so... Uh, it's good fun. You've been involved in many musicals in your... I have, yes. ...past. Quite a few. I was, I was a bit surprised, actually, because I realised recently, uh, you know, I've just been doing a few bits on Desperately Seeking Susan. I was updating my biog, and I thought, God, I have done... I have worked on quite a few musicals now. And I'm not really sure, quite sure how. But that's how it's happened. Do they find you or do you find them? <laughs> um, almost certainly they find me. Um, it's, a, it's a very small world, as you know, the theatre world. And yes. there's not too many illusionists that work within the discipline of, you know, theatre productions. Well, Paul Daniels did the production of Phantom, didn't he, many, many, many he years ago? He did. Well, it's very interesting because, in a way, his work in Phantom is probably the most viewed work of a magic consultant in a musical probably ever done. Uh, because the, one of his illusions is the, uh, the chair at the end where the Phantom disappears which actually he did as a, uh, a, bit, a bit of a last resort solution because there's, there's a much more sophisticated way to do it and he couldn't do it because mm. they would have had to, to cut through the we stage. Rebuild the theatre. <laughs> yes, and you would think by now they would have done the other version, but apparently they keep that version in as an almost sort of superstitious thing. And even the, the Las Vegas version that recently opened, uh, a friend of mine, Bill Smith, did, built the effects for it. And he said that they're absolutely determined to keep that same effect in, even in the even in the Las Vegas version. Are there any new effects in the Las Vegas? Apparently version? there are. Yes, there's another chap called Jim Steinmeier, who oh, you yes. may you may know from Mary Poppins Beauty and, and the uh, Beast. Beauty and the Beast. That's right. He works on that as well, and I think there are a couple of new things. I think the, the mirror is a new moment, and apparently there's an absolutely incredible chandelier in it, which uh, sort of it's assembles in four parts. Apparently, yes, it's uh, that's emerges. meant to be amazing. Yeah, and it's ninety minutes, obviously, rather than and one hundred and seventy-five dollars. $175, obviously not to put on, costs no. a bit more than that to put on. $175 million to mm. put on, probably. Yeah. We're going to start by talking about your new book, Hocus Pocus, which is released, it's on general release now, isn't just, it? Just, yeah, it's just come out. I see you have, you've, I'm very impressed, you've brought along a yes, copy. I was given a copy free by uh, your publicist. Excellent. Mr. Ian Lamb. Very, very good, nice. good. A tale of magnificent magicians and their amazing feats. It's my first book, um, and it, it features an introduction by Daniel Radcliffe, who I worked with... Um, well, I first met when I worked on Harry Potter. Well, you done the magic for the Potter the film. The third, the third, third film, Harry Potter film, which was the, the the one directed by Alfonso Alfonso Cuarón. It was kind of his initiative. But I I taught Daniel Radcliffe for, for some time afterwards. Actually, as a, he he took up magic as a hobby. It wasn't anything to do with the work on the film. He just uh, really loved it and uh, enjoyed it as a hobby, as many teenagers do. And, no um, method acting there. Then. <laughs> no, I mean I think he. He, uh, but he he immediately had the presentation skills to do the magic. You know, he was uh, he only had to look at somebody, and he's got such sort of powerful eyes that mm. uh, he's got the perfect misdirection to get away with many things. So uh, Daniel uh, wrote the introduction to the book. It was actually through through teaching him that I uh, started to have the idea because every time I I started to teach him on the set of Harry Potter during the during the intervals uh, during the breaks. And then uh, he got so into it that w- what what worked out better was for me to go over to his to his home on his days off, and um, I'd always take with me some kind of old book on magic because I, I love the history of magic. Yeah. There are some extraordinary stories, you know, the stories of these great performers from the past, such as Chung Ling Su and the Great Lafayette and Robert Houdin and all these people that have these wonderful names. Um, and uh, I would always take over a book which had a strange story attached to it, uh, or, or had just had something strange about it. So I'd always tell him a little bit about uh, about the history as well as uh, teaching the tricks and, um, you know, to give him a sense of the overall uh, the overall sense of magic that I was interested in. And this is where the idea of the book started to come in. I, th- I thought it would be, be really interesting to put together a book that is part history, part tricks, uh, and gives and an overview. And um, part story as well. Well, this is where, yeah, the, the third aspect became the story. Um, and then, the, in a way, the fourth aspect became the fact that it became very local. It became a very local book and that, uh, you know, I live in Hackney and I've always been fascinated with the Hackney Empire. And I started to do quite a lot of research into the Hackney Empire and realised that all these great magicians, such as Houdini and the great Lafayette and Chung Ling Su, had all appeared there and started to find the dates from the local papers. And, in fact, the book becomes, uh, you know, as it is, part fiction, part real history of the performers um, and, and teaching tricks. Um, but, the, you know, a bit, in a way, the most exciting element for me was bringing in the, 
was bringing in a fictional side, uh, but also bringing you know that that bringing in the fact that I was doing research into the Hackney Empire when these people appeared there, and it all kind of like meshes together. You should um, put a stage show on of it at the Hackney Empire. <laughs> well, I'm doing actually. I'm doing a night at the Hackney Empire on the 16th of December. I'm right. d- I'm doing a, a talk about the magicians of the Hackney Empire, and uh, they've uh, Simon Thompson and, and Susie McKenna uh, have been very supportive of the book. And um, in fact, they're doing you know they're, they're going to be selling it during the pantomime and things like that. Um, but I do you know it's just a genuine love really for that place. I think it's an incredible jewel really that theatre, and it is very magical. I've, I've I was. Uh, lucky enough to perform on the stage there when it when it one of the first shows when it reopened as a kind of variety theater when when the Muldoon sort of took it on in back in 87 and I was in a double act then called uh, called slightly hilariously the Zodiac Brothers and we we appeared there in one of the first variety bills and uh, to stand on the stage it, it, you realize the magic of the Matcham design theatres because you do really feel that you can reach out and touch all the all the audience there, even though that you know it's a huge theatre. Do you prefer to do magic on a grand Las Vegas style <laughs> stage or a small, maybe close up magic? Or I mean, I've, I've always been interested in stage illusion, um, and the point is that it's almost although that there are there are similar techniques. For example, this word misdirection. That I've used it means kind of attention direction really it means you know drawing the eye to where you want the audience to look and by default uh, you know therefore drawing their eye away from where you don't want them to look I remember I saw Macbeth once with uh, <clears throat> Sean Bean in it and a cup dropped on to the stage from a table and then someone disappeared right and of course I thought it was an accident yeah but obviously that was a case of misdirection because everyone yeah, but- looked there and then suddenly I mean, that's, that, that is an example of it. I mean, in a way, that's a very um, obvious use of misdirection. Yeah. In a very, very good, a good misdirection, the audience should, shouldn't be able to backtrack and say where it happened. It can be a very subtle thing, like a, you know, this, the, a gesture of a hand. I mean, if you watch a, a great sleight of hand magician, like there was a magician called Channing Pollock, and, and it was very much to do with just where his eyes were looking and where, you know, he'd run his hands through a silk handkerchief and do a little flourish with his hands, and you would just naturally be drawn to the hand that was flourishing and you, you wouldn't ever believe that his other hand could be getting away with what it was getting away with and um so they really but, do hypnotize you in a way <laughs> well i think i think what's really interesting i mean getting, getting back to this thing of of do i prefer you know stage or, or close-up um on on a stage and in particular it, on a theater stage and this thing is where we start to get into the musical theater stuff um there are so many elements that you can use to make the magic happen um obviously the obvious fact being that on a proscenium arch stage uh, in being, you know, the traditional theatre which has a front of house and a, yeah. you know, backstage area rather than and in the round theatre. Um, understage, above stage, you know, flying facilities. There's obviously all these incredible things at, at, your, disposal, at uh, your disposal as an illusionist. And, of course, the great touring illusionists, like I write about in, in Hocus Pocus, they, they all would have moved into the theatres and used all these things and they would have cut their own trap doors and had, you know, dozens of assistants and pulling wires and... You know, operating trapdoors, and of course, the, the sort of part, part of the frustration as a magic act these days is that you can't do that. You can't turn up at, you know, uh, the sun, Sunday night, at, at, you know, pl- Sunday night charity show at the Palladium. Say, do you mind if I cut a trap in your stage because I want I want to vanish a lady at the end? Um, and, and and it was partly a frustration because I had a fascination with those things, but I couldn't really use a lot of the techniques. Mm. And my first theatre show was the uh, the Invisible Man at the Theatre Royal Stratford East. I was asked to do that back in 1991 through through. Uh, the actress Kate Williams, who used to host the Variety Night. Uh, and there, of course, you sort of could start to do this because you had the whole, you know, theatre at your disposal for, uh, you yeah, know, there was a fit-up and, and uh, you know, it was Stratford, it was like a five or six-week run. But we still had, could, and, and I, you know, the lighting and the, the sound and all the, the fact that Ken Hill was very adaptable with the script, you know, he would rewrite a whole scene to make an effect work. I mean, it was an amazing introduction, actually, to musical theatre because he was an pretty amazing there, uh, guy. Fifty fifty three illusions in this. Yes, I mean I, we, I'm not quite sure how it was counted. How it was counted, but um, uh, some of them, of course, were quite small illusions. Um, so I think I think they probably counted like when when the Invisible Man opened a drawer, like the little latch went up on the drawer, and then mm. the drawer opened. Well, you do count the latch flick, flicking up as one thing, and the drawer opening. And and I suppose in some ways to, to count them, um, although it was quite fun for you know they forgot the show into the Guinness Book of Records. I'm not quite sure what it actually means. I think probably more significant was that a, a, a couple of the effects that were probably not never done, that had never been done before, 
Um, some of, some of them were were really quite risky. I mean, we didn't we didn't in the respect of we didn't know if they were going to succeed. Um, but the, the 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 probably the most talked about effect in the show was the unmasking of the Invisible Man at the end of Act One, where he takes the bandages off his head, and there's nothing there. And there's not, not only nothing there, but he smokes a cigarette without a head, mm. and then proceeds to take off the rest of his clothes. And there's, of course, there's, there's absolutely nothing there. And um, did that get a round of applause every night? Well, it used to get sort of gasps at Stratford, I think, particularly because people were, especially the first run where people weren't expecting it. When when it came into the West End, I think became it, was, the it became uh, the expected moment, and it still got a good reaction, but. It wasn't quite like that first time at Stratford. Uh, and we had terrible trouble getting that effect right. And it only really was succeeded quite genuinely. It sounds like a sort of theatrical story, but it was only right the night before the, the press night. And, and I can distinctly remember when, when I, I got that effect right with, with the team of people that were helping me on it. Um, that uh, I remember Ken Hill, who, who was not an easy man to please. He was very stinting when it came to praise. Um, just just looking round from his seat at the front of the circle and kind of giving me a nod as if oh yeah it's working now and that that was like the highest praise you'd get from Ken actually Ken of course was was also known in the musical theatre as doing the original Phantom of the Opera okay um, he did he did the before he, Andrew Lloyd Webber took it well no he yeah he did he did uh, Phantom of the Opera at at uh, originally I think at the end of a pier I can't remember which pier it was but then he did. Uh, um, Is this one called Phantom? He, no, he, his one was called the Phantom of the Opera. Oh. The mu- um, and he, he did that at Stratford East and Cameron Mackintosh and Lloyd Webber came to see it oh. and, and they were having discussions about it. And in fact, if you read the, even the programme of Phantom, Lloyd Webber's Phantom, he does acknowledge and credit... This is the one with all opera hits in it. And opera all. hits, yeah. He does yeah. credit Ken Hills as being uh, one of the roots of the idea. Um, and, you know, obviously what, what came next was, was quite interesting because Ken was smart enough to take his show to America and quite rightly called it Phantom of the Opera, the original stage musical. And you know, became a millionaire yeah. from it, um, but you know, quite rightly in a way. And it, his Phantom was uh, a totally different show. I mean, uh, you know, it was it was uh, came from a English rep theatre, you know. And so, but Ken was an amazing person to train with. He was a protege of uh, Joan Littlewood, and it was Ken really that, that I had my, if you like, my theatre training for, from being thrown in at the deep end. Mm-hmm. Ken had had a wonderful sort of quite cavalier attitude in some respects and, and he, he would always have this phrase um, he would never be told something wasn't possible he hated that idea and he'd always say um, oh, we can just jig it out of a bit of ply was his thing if somebody said you know oh we can't afford that prop um, he was infinitely adaptable and he was an amazing guy to, to train with so yeah Invisible Man was, was my first thing in theatre and that was um, you know I, I don't know my life would have been very different probably without The Invisible Man Impressive thing to start with. Because it's, well, it was it was a lucky thing to start with, and and also I was, I was probably just ready for it. Um, I love that saying that um, you know that, that 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 luck is a is a lifetime of preparation meeting a moment of opportunity, and uh, I think it was probably true of that in that I I um, was obsessed with magic. I I loved it, I, and I in particular visual magic. I'd researched a lot about the old illusions and. Uh, at that, that point in my life, I was—I just finished the double act. I'd come out. We'd just done a, a cruise on the QE2. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing next, and I had the time to put into that show. So I, I worked on it for about four and a half months, fairly solidly, um, and put all I had. I mean, my heart and soul went into that show. And um, Ken was an incredibly dedicated man, and the team at Stratford—they just led led on. You know, it was a series of lucky things. So it opened um, just before my twenty-fourth birthday, and and. Uh, of course, the the the, the uh, for for me in, for my career, I suppose the rest is history. In the respect of the reviews, were amazing for the illusions, and I mm. I, I never imagined. I didn't even know the Times were going to be in to review it, and that was the that was the start of it already. You leave Houdini in this book until last. <laughs> Um, is this one of the magicians that inspired you the most? Illusionist. I, I <clears throat> no, I mean the funny thing is that I mean it's been written about, and I, and I tend to believe it too that Houdini was a pretty lousy magician. Uh, in in traditional senses, uh, he was a master showman. A one trick horse. He, no, I mean he was he wasn't a one trick horse. He he was he just knew about the importance of effect, the effect and the hype. Um, and he was I'm not uh, denying he was an absolutely extraordinary human being. Um, uh, just so um, obsessive and dedicated to every everything that he did. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, I had lunch with a chap called Bill Kalouche, who's just written a, a book about Houdini being a spy called The Secret Life of Harry Houdini. And Bill Kalouche is um, David Blaine's manager. 
and he was telling me that Houdini, when he used to appear in English theatres in the First World War, would ask if there was anyone going over to going to fight in the in 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 you know in in the war, and he would go and meet all the soldiers in the intervals and tell them tips about how to escape from the German prisons because he would he would have been on the inside of all that and yeah. seen it. And uh, and his fight with the spiritualists um, and all of that. He, he's an amazing guy. But in the book, the book became in itself, I mean, very, very roughly, the, the story being that there's a young magician who has a collection of these amazing old posters. I mean, I'm a co- post collector of posters, stone lithograph posters. They're, they're, they've got these incredible headings on them, you know, like, like you know, the, the world's greatest magician or, you know, a gift from the gods to mortals, you know, these, these sort of very modest statements. The collection of posters basically one by one come to life uh, and and what you what you see are the real acts of the of this um of these great magicians and it becomes a kind of variety show mm-hmm. it becomes what it's describing but of course it happens over the course of the year in in the home of of this young magician who is kind of loosely based on me so so it became a natural thing Hackney. yeah and it became a sort of natural thing that houdini you had to have a top of the bill and houdini vanishing an elephant just had to be the top of the bill so it wasn't, I suppose, out of my respect for Houdini. There are other people that I probably... It was the running order, in a way. It was the running order. I thought, well, how do you finish a show? And in a way, Houdini, the biggest, the brashest, the, the biggest name, you know, still it amazed me. I just did an uh, interview last, last week for, for Go For It on Radio 4. And uh, there were th- four kids in the studio, and the one magician they'd heard of was, was Houdini. And, and they were, this, these, these kids were nine or ten. And, and I, I think that's incredible, you know, that he... <laughs> somehow kids of 10 yeah. heard of Houdini died 80, over 80 years ago it's, it's, it's sort of the magician name isn't it it's, well it is it's amazing isn't it? the image of him sort of floating over a river trying to escape from <clears throat> straight jacket and things yeah but you know he was actually he, he named himself after a French magician called uh, Robert Houdin oh. who was um, and he, 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 Houdin was, the, was, a, a, was an incredible magician and also a pioneer of he was like the first man to have an electric light bulb in his home, in domestic use, uh, and made these incredible automata. And Houdini supposedly named himself Houdini because he was told it meant like Houdan. Uh, so Houdini has sort of carried Houdan's name. What was his real him. name? Houdini was Eric Weiss. W e i double s. He was actually born in. Uh, Doesn't Budapest. have the same ring to it, does it? No, uh, he he was he was actually yeah he was from from Hungary, a Jew, Jewish uh, immigrant to America. But he then claimed uh, through most of his life that he was really born in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, which wasn't, of course, the case. He was a, he was actually born son, son, son of an Orthodox rabbi, um, and um, yeah, I mean his life story is amazing. And of course, a lot of people, it's a lot of uh, there have been many many musicals written about Houdini. Every, every, about every two weeks, somebody tells me I've got this great idea. I'll do a musical about Houdini. Well, do have, the magic tricks. There have been many. There have been many. Believe well, me. Th- there's a very great musical called Ragtime, based mm. on the novel and the film, which features uh, sort of Houdini's. He sort of appears in it, and uh, he, there's lots of magic tricks in that show. Mm. I think designed by Stan Meyer, and um, sadly the big production never came here. But we had a little production with um, just an orchestra on stage. Yeah, I believe the they don't I, disappear, I, so. I believe the American version had. I think it, the magic was done by a chap called Franz Harari. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah. And yes, yeah, so I, th- I know that. I, n- I never saw the. Uh, I never saw the production over here, but uh, was obviously from, heard about it. Uh, but no, I mean Houdini. I think Houdini came to represent, you know, the repressed or the 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 the, the immigrant American breaking free of his box chains, chains and, and and making it big in America. Is it? He, you know, he, re- he represents in the sense that the American dream. What um, what most musicals are about, if you yeah, think about it. Yeah, yeah. So you can see why people might think he would make a good subject. But Ken Hill always used to say say to me in a rather gruff way, "I'm never doing a show about a dead American." So Ken was never... I remember seeing on the Dragon's Den people submitting an idea for another Houdini musical. Yeah, no, it's... it's uh, everyone don't always do thinks it, it's a great idea. Well, no, I mean, I, th- I think there probably is a good idea somewhere in there, but I don't think it's the straight-down-the-line story. I think it's... Uh... It would just be... I think the audience would go with, it, with expectations of just seeing a magic show. You'd well, have to get a story out of it. You do have a terrible problem with something like that, in that you've got a reputation of a man. I suspect even if you saw Houdini himself now, he'd be disappointing, you know. He couldn't live up to his own reputation. And when you try and do a musical and you've got to try and recreate supposedly these incredible stunts that were so breathtaking and unbelievable, then you've immediately got the problem of how do you actually do them and make them look good. I mean, there was a whole Houdini section in in Michael Crawford's EFX in Las Vegas. That was one of the four people that the show was about. 
and and they had even with all the Vegas illusion builders and all of that behind them, the, the magic in it was just never very strong. And sometimes it's best to the strongest moments are sometimes in shows. They're not about a magician. They happen in a show and they happen as a part of the storyline, which is what I suppose my favourite part of my work that I do. The best example of that I've seen was a couple of years ago when I went to the London Palladium and had the pleasure of seeing Tommy Steele <laughs> in A Christmas Carol. Yes. Um, were the intent of the illusions to scare the shit out of the audience? <clears throat> or, w- 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 I mean, they were absolutely... They were the talking point of the show. I mean, everyone well, just is- remembers the illusions. <laughs> Well, that's kind of you to say so. I mean, this is the Leslie Bricus uh, Scrooge, Scrooge yeah, musical, Scrooge musical based on the 1970s movie, which is coming out yet again this year, just about to open in Southampton with Shane Ritchie doing a short tour and doing Manchester Palace for, for Christmas. That It's an amazing show, that, because, in fact, the very first uh, year it was done, 93, as a stage show, it was Paul Daniels did the effects. Mm-hmm. And then um, they, for some reason, they had some trouble with them and Paul wasn't available to do them the following year. And Paul recommended me for the for the job. And the director was Bob Thompson, who, of course, did Blood Brothers. And Paul Farnsworth designed it. I mean, it showed, you know, Paul has done a lot of musicals. Um, has a lot of stuff at Regent's Park and he's a terrific designer. Um, and, of course, well, I, th- I think, you know, in, in a nutshell, it's all there in the, di- in the Dickens. I mean, Charles Dickens had a great sense of of showmanship well he was from um, the Victorian era he was from the Victorian these... era also interestingly enough an amateur magician oh, okay uh, you know very keen amateur magician and uh, some of the you know when Scrooge is startled well that's your job to, to deliver that and if you can startle the audience at the same time then, then great there's one bit where the goat where Marley appears which... yeah through, just sort of walks through the wall so yeah it's great because people do jump and that I always think is a it's a very difficult thing to uh, to achieve in a theatre because because uh, it's but it's the timing of what goes before it. How much of um, it goes down to the actors because they're they're in effect, they're in essence the magicians, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, a huge part of it. I mean, in that production, I had to work very closely with Tommy Steele. I mean, originally actually Anthony Newley was the lead in that, and um, I've done you know worked also God, with his soul. Yeah, yeah, and also uh, in in America it was Richard Chamberlain played that role. Um, and uh, of course, last year also Michael Barrymore played it on tour, and Shane Ritchie have quite, been quite a few sort of star names. Um, and because it's it's a star role, you know, yeah. it's a starring role. And I think that it's the, the Christmas role. It know. is it is the Christmas role. And there's something about the Leslie Brickus version, which I mean, you know, not all the songs are you know groundbreaking, but it does have that terrific song "Thank You Very Much" in it, and and there is something about it that works terrifically well and it is a little bit it is something also that it's very like like eating christmas pudding and and christmas it's, dinner it's the only christmas musical that could play at the london yeah, palladium it is yeah and it, and it's it's also you know paul's design is very traditional um you know it, it is victorian london it's all those things and i think it's what people want at christmas and and it is the great story, isn't it? I just think it's one of the great stories of all time. A friend of mine always says it's a great story because it's the story of Freudian psychology. It's a man, you know, whose life is, you know, is not right. And he looks back into his past and looks at his present and sees what his future will be like if he doesn't change. And uh, But I think it, 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 it's one of those stories. There's a few things in theatre, I think, that you can almost, even in quite a bad version, they're quite stirring. And I'm not saying that Scrooge, you know, Scrooge is a good... You know, it's it's a good it's a good musical, and it's it's done. You know, it's a good production, but you can actually see quite a ropey production of Christmas Carol, and there's something still stirring about that redemption. Yeah, um, and it's one of the, it's so it's, it has a sort of machine about it that, that you can't fail but to be stirred at the end, and in the end, uh, that's what a lot of musicals, you know, lack. You don't have that when you go to the theatre a lot of the time, and if you can feel that you've been on a kind of redemptive journey or some sort of you want to feel that you've been on an emotional journey in a show, obviously, and and that fortunately is what Scrooge gives you. Um, but no, I mean, the, uh, my favourite moment with Scrooge is actually that you know Leslie Brook has put this twist in that the ghost of Christmas Past turns out to be the spirit of Scrooge's dead sister, oh. and just at the end she turns to him, you know, says, "Why did you not like, love your nephew, he, he, Harry? She, she, uh, he he was my son, and he he realises that this is his sister, and she walks up towards a full length mirror, and says, says the final words, and he." As he realises that she, he's going to, she's going to go. He runs up to her and grabs her shoulders, and then her cloak falls away in his hands, and suddenly she's she's Behind passed the through the mirror, and, and she, she fades sort of away. comes like a ghost in the other side of the mirror. And it's also a really, really good magic trick. Like magicians go and see it; they can't work it out because you can see all the mirror around it. Did you go back to the Victorian 
were you almost paying homage to Victorian style of illusions in this show? Yeah, well, very modern much so. Techniques? I mean, that, that was that was very deliberate, specifically um, uh, inspired by an illusion called Vanity Fair that was first performed by a magician called Herman in in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, and um, it's a different version of it. But Vanity Fair was a girl vanishing in front of a mirror. And I'd actually had the idea before I was asked to do Scrooge. I wanted to do a vanish in front of a mirror. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that came up and and Bob Thompson uh, asked me, you know, asked me for other ideas. Um, But in terms of the, the, you know, I just think the structure of that show, it's an ideal show for for magic effects. Of course. Uh, And there aren't that many shows like that. But when they come along, they're a gift because the magic, it becomes the central point in the story. It's a little bit like another production I did, not a musical, but Theatre of Blood. I did at the National Theatre. A um, couple of years ago, which is a whole different thing, it was uh, uh, the lead character was played by Jim Broadbent about a hammy old actor called Lionheart who takes vengeance on all his crit- critics. I thought that was the one you and murders about. them one at a time in, in the We've style. We've all of, felt like doing that. Yeah, he murders them one at a time in the style of a Shakespearean play, and, and the murders are kind of, kind of these central plot points. Um, so they were all kind of things that I was, I was involved with. And so, yeah, certain productions like that, I and mean, obviously Invisible Man, obviously, because invisibility becomes a central thing. Let's talk about The Witches of Eastwick. Mm. With uh, You made the lovely Rosie Ash have yeah. stuff come out of her mouth. Vomiting lessons. <laughs> During that song. Yeah. Evil. Um, evil. Yeah, and a few other moments. Well, um, I never saw The Witches of Eastwick, which mm. I, I regret, because... It, I've got the score at home, and it sounds like a fantastic right. musical. That- but uh, no, I did, I did do the main, the main thing in um, Witches of Eastwick was which I, which I worked on with another magician, originally from Chiswick, funnily enough, called oh. Simon Drake. Um, was was the uh, was the the fact vomiting that Fel- Felicia, who's the goody goody, uh, you know, one who's complaining about the evil that's going on in the town. Anything that goes into the cookie jar in the in the in the uh, in the den comes out of Felicia's mouth. So they put, you know, it, during the course of the show, there's a tennis ball, a, uh, you know, chicken feathers, uh, a, a necklace. Um, the coin, candles. Coins, candles. Uh, yeah, I can't, and of course, at the end, she throws up a huge volume of, of cherry stones, which in caused quite a few interesting moments on the stage of Drury Lane. Let's just say that. <laughs> Were the things actually in her mouth, or did she have to... Well, Rosie studied for hours and hours on that, and um, she was absolutely brilliant and uh you know at certain points yes they are but they have to get there at points that are appropriate in the song so she had to time her and you can't sing with performance no throat. but i mean that was what was so incredible and she just worked very very hard on that and she was doing a lot of you know basically sleight of hand and i, and I suppose sleight of mouth she's very good at with, with them being very <laughs> angry rosie ash um <laughs> Not a show of yours, but Rosie, um, just Mary Poppins in mm. general. Yeah. It's such a fantastic magic show in a way. Mm. Um, and it, do you think Disney ha- has had a sort of surge in bringing back illusion to the stage? Um, no, no, I don't think speci- specifically. I mean, funnily enough, I, I, w- I was employed by them uh, back in um, the end of the 90s. I, I was actually, I, I, I was developing a project with them, um, which was, called the Untitled Invisibility Project. They wanted to do an invisibility musical and they contacted me and I went over to Burbank and in fact Bob Crowley was meant to be designing mm-hmm. it um, and then I think designing and directing. And when I was over there with Bob, uh, you know, in the first meetings and that was just when AIDA had its kind of, they had a big change of design and in fact when I was there it was, it was exactly when Bob was, was called in to do AIDA and of course that was the first of his many sort of Disney projects. Um and they they're funny with with illusion because um i think in in a sense you know stage illusion is very different to film illusion and you have to sort of accept that and sort of take the ball by the horns and 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 um and i think in in some ways i think perhaps they you know it was difficult to develop the invisibility project because i think the the script kept going around to things that you could really only do in film um and um you know so that so i'm i'm not sure that they have i mean Obviously, Mary Poppins has got some terrific work by Jim Steinmeier, who is, uh, you know, someone that I hugely respect. He's also musical theatre people wouldn't necessarily know this, but he's he's a kind of legend within the magic world. I mean, he's invented many illusions that are considered to be modern classic illusions, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> and he's also the most phenomenal writer. I mean, he's written a book which you should definitely have a look at called the Hi- Hi- "Hiding the Elephant," yeah. which is just one of the which most magnificently written um, histories of of not only magic but sort of popular entertainment and 
and the, the, the story of the espionage between the magicians. I mean, I touch on it in Hocus Pocus to a certain extent, but Hocus Pocus is more of a, a young reader's book. Mm. But um, For the adults listening, you should get Stan. Well, I think they should get both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they should buy Hocus Pocus first. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, in Tick Whittington, I presume this was a pantomime. Yes, Tick Whittington. It sounds very dark, because you, you, it, it's written as a spectacular rats sequence. And... Um, a self-assembling body from yes. different body parts. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't a music. It wasn't a pantomime. It wasn't a pantomime. It was. Um, it was a strange thing because it was a. It was Sadler's Wells wanted to do a an alternative Christmas show. Right. Um, in in the, in a similar vein, I suppose. I think they'd done. The, they they had had the uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe there a couple of years, and um, so it was produced by Sadler's Wells, and the it was directed and choreographed by Gillian Lynn, uh, and it was. I think it was, uh, and I think Stephen Stephen Clark, I think wrote it. That'd be Stephen Clark. Um, it was um, it, it was a fu- it was a funny piece in the end because it used it used sort of existing music uh, and had new lyrics written to them. Um, Nicholas Grace played Grimaldi, so the because Grimaldi originally performed at Saddles World, so the opening of the show was actually Grimaldi, the clown, sort of assembling himself. After it's the famous years. image of the clown as we know it today, isn't it? I believe. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean, Grima- well, Grimaldi was um, with the tall hat and the. Well, he he was just very. He was a very uh, particular. He had a very particular makeup, very white face with very pronounced sort of features. Um, and the did French a lot, clown did a lot of kind of. Um, Hey, he was an Eng- he was an oh. English. Um, he, he I mean he he lived um, he lived in in the Islington area. In fact, there's a church on on Penterville Road that's uh, known as the Grimaldi Church that he where he was buried. And he was he used to double up. He used to perform at Saddle as well as Anne at Drury Lane and uh, just a phenomenal visual comedian. Um, he used to do a, a routine assembling a cart out of French cheeses and then riding it. I don't. I, it doesn't sound particularly funny. And he always used to have sausages on his belt. So, so Nicholas Gray sort of researched all this and the opening of the show was, was basically Grimaldi assembling himself. So his legs all came along separately and his body and his head. And wow. His, and, he, and it all, they, literally they, they climbed out the stage individually and crawled across the stage and came together in quite a creepy way and then, and then they became Nick Grace. At one point, it was a it was a body with a, without a head, and the head was kind of rolling along a cloth. And he flicked the, the head up in the air, and it landed on his shoulders, and he stepped forward. That sounds absolutely terrifying. Um, <laughs> it was, I mean, it was it was uh, the opening of the show. Um, it was it was a tricky show, and it didn't uh, didn't entirely work, and it didn't uh, didn't get the greatest of reviews. Um, but uh, that's the, yeah, that was another. But uh, you did your job well. It sounds like it was uh, it was a fun one to work with. I mean, Gillian Lynn was just I don't know if you've ever met her. It was just extraordinary, extraordinary. Uh, lady and so energetic and um, really uh, just lovely, lovely person, you know. And, and it, w- it was great to work with her. It was very inspiring to work with her. And uh, you know, obviously she's, she's you know became well known for Cats and, and Phantom and all that stuff. So I don't suspect she's struggling. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> um, our house, another yes. another world record for you. Well, uh, well, our, well, our house was. Um, Let's just say Our House is a madness jukebox musical, but in, in my opinion, it's a very good jukebox musical, musical because the story is incredibly strong and quite complex as a psychological <clears throat> drama of this character. Yeah, I characters. Mean, Our House, I suppose, is interesting for a, for a few reasons. Firstly, it was um, I've I've done a, many shows with the director Matthew Warchus, and this was the second show I did with uh, Matthew Warchus and Rob Howe. And the first that I did with Matthew Warchus, Rob Howell, and Peter Darling. And of course, we all went on to do Lord of the Rings. Um, our house had a, a kind of sliding doors type yeah. double storyline. And quite early on, Matthew called me up and said, I'm trying to work out whether to do this show with two with two lead actors or one. And when I say sliding doors, if you're not, f- not familiar with it, the, the basic plot line is that a, a guy has, he has a, it's his 16th birthday. He tries to impress his girlfriend and he commits a petty crime. And he has the cho- and the police uh, he has the choice of running away from the police or giving himself up. So actually, he splits in half, and he does both. And for the rest of the he doesn't show, literally split in half, isn't it? Well, it sort of does. I mean, he, you, well, you kind of see it. That's what the first magical moment is. You see him divide into two identical versions of himself. One of them runs off, and one of them stays, g- gives himself up. And you follow the story. You know what happens to the guy that does the kind of right thing, and what happens to the guy that does the wrong thing. Um, so there are these continual thing so Matthew was deciding well should, should it be two people or one person do I did I think it was possible to do it with one person I said well I think we could probably go for it so I became sort of quite a I was involved from a quite an early stage 
and everything had to be designed and there was a huge amount of work on on quick change and that was uh, actually how i got to know guinness world records because um it was proposed the idea was proposed that we should look into the fact well that, that it was almost certainly a, a world record for michael gibson because he had to play not only the equivalent of two lead roles in the musical but he changed costumes completely 28 times every performance um so so Guinness World Records came in and did, did they, they, they tracked him and the, 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 his principal um, dresser, Murray Lame, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, awarded, I think Murray got a world record, you know, certificate, and I did it in Matthew, and it was, it was good fun. And that's actually how I came to, they then asked me whether I would be the consultant for, the magic consultant for Guinness World Records, and after that I designed two double-page spreads for the book. There'd never mm-hmm. been a magic spread in the Guinness World Records before then, and I um, was, was involved in, in those two that happened. Um, but no, our, our house was a very different sort of show for me because it, you know I was talking about where magic is really central to the plot like yeah. in Scrooge or Invisible Man well obviously our house it's not central to it it's just the incidental things it's so the visual lo- style of telling the story yeah isn't a, it? a lot of it well okay there was a big sequence at, M- Rock, uh, at the end of Act, uh, end of Act 1 where apparently Joe bad Joe is up on the Albert Bridge above and good Joe has ended up in prison and they're apparently in two places at once and in a way the end of Act 1 is a kind of illusion where Good Joe is suddenly in prison, and um, you can buy the DVD of our house. You can if you want buy to the DVDs, it. and it's actually very well filmed. I'm going to go home and watch it. So I, I think it was a really great show. It was. Uh, I think it was just, and it always had good audiences. I think it was just a show that always sat slightly. It was slightly more expensive to run than it was taking uh, because it it was it was deceptively high cost show that because mm. there were teams of dressers. I mean, not not just for the Joe thing. So it was uh, and quite elaborate sets as well. Yeah, I mean, quite they, elaborate sets, and I think they are talking about it coming out on tour, and I think it would could do very well. And a terrific uh, script by Tim Firth. The story is wonderful. Um, and I think by the time we we settled it all in, I mean, so many people say to me they just loved that show, and it won the Olivier Award that year for best new musical. And I think it was very different to uh, any of the other pop, you know, the, the pop musicals. jukebox musicals. It, it, it was a, a Tim Firth did an incredible job. They really seemed like the songs were written for the show. Um, because yeah. I remember listening to Mad, I'm, I'm a big fan of Madness. Mm. I remember years ago listening to their songs and sort of stringing a musical together in my head. Yeah, and it just made me happy to see mm. such a wonderful, wonderful musical version of Madness songs. Mm. But it was out. interesting. It's we all, you know, I remember the first time I ever heard about Lord of the Rings was on the closing night of our house where Matthew Warchus came up and he said oh, I've, I've taken this on um, and of well, course we all went on Matthew Warchus uh, myself Peter Darling you know went, went on to do uh, Lord of the Rings so, uh, Lord of the Rings visually is a fantastic fantastic musical I mean even before the show starts we mentioned in the episode you know you have fireflies flying yeah that was the one of my big sort of contributions the show is a pre-show <laughs> Um, it, I mean, of course, it's not a musical as as we. It's an experience. Yeah, you know, they, they've they've never tried to say it is. It's just no. if you don't call it a musical, people think it's all oh, that seems expensive for a play. It's a musical sized experience in all in every respect, but it's not. You don't have Frodo stand, you know, standing centre stage singing about what what he should do about the Ring, and in some ways, you know, that's that's one of the things that musicals do very well is that you can suddenly stop and know what a character is doing at one time. So. Yeah. It's not an easy task, but it has been a, an absolute labour of love for, you know, Chris Nightingale and Matthew and Matthew Warchus, and uh, it, it is a, it is a phenomenal piece of theatre. You know, people say, say to me from outside theatre, like old school friends, things like that. Oh, you know, should we go and see it? And I and I say to them, absolutely, honestly, you will never see another show like that in London. You have to see it to you form your own opinion. It. And everyone has an opinion on it, and uh, you know, I don't think anyone claims that it's perfect, but it's. It's a phenomenal achievement, and I'm you know very proud to be involved with it. Just run us through some of the effects that happen in this show, because <clears throat> I, because I had trouble getting a grasp of everything when mm. I saw it, because a I was four thousand miles away, and yeah. b it was just so much happening. At what the tricks I remember is Bilbo Baggins disappears. Well, yeah, I mean it's probably my you know m- most of my best bits are over as it were <laughs> for the show. Just compile them all together and put uh, them into know, one I did, musical. I did the pre-show with the fireflies, you know, the Hobbits catching yeah. the fireflies, and then the, the, Bil- the Bilbo Vanish is, is uh, as a, as a theatre effect, is interesting in that it, it is, um, it sounds terribly modest to say it's groundbreaking, but it is that groundbreaking in that respect of, as you imagine, the facilities that I have there are different to, you know, many things, and it just happens that what we can do there, what is possible at the beginning of that show, I can't always do if it's in the middle of a show. 
So you will see something there that you won't won't see anywhere else. And I've had magicians, you know, even from America and stuff that have come in and have been actually quite puzzled about how mm. that's done. A lot of magicians had a, a very amusing conversation with Darren Brown a couple of weeks ago because he came Lovely to the opening night. And uh, uh, we, 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 we had this wonderful conversation where Darren... Darren explained in great detail how he did the newspaper prediction and I t- told him in great detail how, how the Bilbo Vanish was done. I mean, we just came from these completely different opposite ends of the, the spectrum yeah, of the same business. But, you know, it's really interesting, actually, that. But no, a lot of... it's not you. But basically, he disappears in front of your he, very he disappears, eyes. He does disappear in front of your eyes. It's the sort of thing... It gets me into a lot of trouble, that, because even, even since I've had directors and producers are phoning up saying, oh, you know, like, the way you do that Vanish in Lord of the Rings? Well, we're doing this show in a shed at the back of... <laughs> You know, and we want My to garden. do that, and I'm like, well, actually, it's very specific to the fact that it's the beginning of the show, and you know, but you can, can say it's it. not Pepper's Ghost. It's not Pepper's Ghost. No, it has it has a relation to to that type of optical magic, mm-hmm. but it is definitely not Pepper's Ghost because Pepper's Ghost, in fact, required a huge orchestra pit, sort of a, a sort of a huge trap to be opened in the stage with an, an actor inclined backwards, and this is this is the, probably the most famous Victorian stage effect, Pepper's Ghost. It, First done in the you know I think 1863 at the Polytechnic in London in Regent Street. What people don't realise is Pepper's Ghost was first done as a, as part of a lecture as part of a lecture. It wasn't done as a in a theatre show. Uh, it required an enormous enormous sheet of glass and actor inclined backwards on on um, hidden from the audience and w- was illuminated and people actually looked through the glass and saw what mm. appeared to be a ghost on the stage most famously it's used by Walt Disney at the Haunted Mansion ride yeah I mean I, d- I did a, a, a show a couple of years ago with, with, with the artist Marissa Karneski called Karneski's Ghost Train excuse me um, that um, played in Brick Lane it was a, it was a, a, a theatre show inside a ghost train did you, did you ever see it you'd no, have loved sorry. it actually we, we, we found out earlier that we're both it's on video well i have actually got i'll show you later i have okay. a video of it but um uh yeah we both found out earlier we're both fans of the haunted mansion at disney which is who isn't of, i mean it, it, yeah. it's such a theatrical piece we were saying this before we sat down to record but um you you are staring at a sheet of glass well the, i think the thing about uh, i think about what you can do in a in a ghost train ride uh, we did a lot of those style illusions in in uh, the ghost in Karneski's ghost train uh, is that you can set these things up and the audience travels past them at their own speed um, so you can have a permanent exhibit mm. and that's why you know the haunted mansion is so extraordinary because you're traveling through various sets and you don't have to you don't have to worry about scene changes because you're moving through them so you can do um, whatever you like and you can set these things up and have you know do you notice that um, they're dancing a waltz at this point and the um the, the the women are leading the men, which well, is a big mistake. I, I have I have heard that, but I've never I've never um, I've never noticed it while I've been on the ride. I've heard it, and I don't know whether it's an urban myth thing. We have um, a wonderful version in Paris. I don't know if you've been mm, to that one. It's just uh, but the Phantom the, Manor. So many magic illusions in in that, and mm. it's just amazing. That well, they, it is it is interesting, and uh, you know, it's an interesting demonstration of the illusion that became known as Pepper's Ghost, as I was explaining earlier, it was originally in fact called the Dirksy and Phantasmagoria, which I think this had the same ring to it. Called Henry Dirks really invented it and Pepper got all the credit. Um well it's quite quite an interesting story. Maybe that would make a good good musical. But um yeah, that uh, so so well the other effect uh, I mean it has to be said that a lot of the effects in Lord of the Rings, I mean then it's probably got the largest lighting rig ever done in the West End, I suspect. You know, Paul Pine. The lighting was yeah. go- I mean in a way to me the lighting help tell the story because it mm. sort of sweeps across the stage mm. as the stage was ev- ev- evolving yeah. in another I mean, direction. It's difficult to sort of pinpoint. My, my, normally when I work on a show, my stuff tends to be, um, you know, my illusions tend to be uh, amongst the most complex part of the technical side. And on Lord of the Rings, it was just like nothing. The compared, actors must love you. <laughs> well, just compared to the immense other stuff that was going on. And of course, you've got things like, you know, the she lob and wasn't it uh, six weeks of technical rehearsals? Oh, it's more long, it was, much longer than that. Well, we, the, I'm trying to think. Actually, we did the get in uh, in the theatre. The get in after the producers started, like January the eighth, and we didn't do a, we didn't do a preview till May the tenth or something. Uh, so I think it no, it probably was six or seven weeks of technicals and and dress rehearsals and and it is you know it's an epic piece of theatre. Uh, but I like the way the musical didn't try to be. How can I say this? It, it, it was 
as if you were seeing it in the theatre. Mm. During some of the flying scenes, you could plainly see they weren't thin wires, they were ribbons. Yeah. And, you know, you had theatrical devices being... You, you didn't have, like, real water on stage, you had mm. cloth. It went mm. back to very old-fashioned theatrical devices, which I thought was wonderful yeah, in, in as well. in a way, as, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it... But it has to be said, it's also probably the most complex I'm sure engineering. I mean, the, the, the stage floor, which has become fairly Infamous. famous for, for, for good and bad reasons. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the stage floor is, is a thing of, of wonder. It's an incredible thing to see. I, mean, I remember when I first saw it at Dell Star Engineering, I just couldn't believe the precision involved. And the, the actual the interface between the, the design, the way that the stage floor, in a way, is choreographed, to the music in the in uh, every mi- minutest movement of it, and that's all done on a computer. And the interface between the computer and the stage floor was a was a pioneering piece of software. A special piece of software was written for that. It cost a million pounds to do the stage alone. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard various figures. I mean, I, I don't. I, I I would say it's probably you know money well spent. If you look at sometimes when you look when you hear what things have cost, uh, it, it's something that you certainly look at and you know where it's gone, mm. where the money's gone. <laughs> um, you know, and the show is you know it's certainly. As I say, it's worth seeing. I, I I've heard all sorts of opinions on it, and um, you know, it's it's it is an incredible and quite brown, groundbreaking piece of theatre. We all have our opinions on it here at the, at the podcast, mm. but I mean, we, we all agreed that technically, visually, mm. and illusionally, yeah, it was just groundbreaking, and it r- really is a phenomenal and unique show to this mm. city. And um, well, I think there's another interesting thing. It's a general point: is that there's a lot of there can be a lot of snobbery t- towards spectacle. It's something I've talked to a lot of people about, designers. I had a very really interesting conversation to Bill Dudley when I was working with The Woman in White and um, about the fact that in some ways if you do something that's really visual, people tend to be more critical of it than, than uh, perhaps they should be. And, uh, and I don't know why that is, but if you... It's almost something like it, you, you shouldn't be that generous to the audience visually. You no. should leave it. To if the you pay sixty five pounds a ticket, you want them, you want to have nothing. In a way, on but I don't think there's any. You know, I mean, of course, magic is partly it's a visual thing, but I've found that in in my own my own work that sometimes um, you know I've studied this all my life. There there is an art to magic. There's there's a history to it. It's not an easy thing to do right. You know, it's it's something that's very obvious when it's not done right. People always have an opinion on it, and yet. It, people can almost dismiss it uh, as a sort of oh well that's just that that thing and sometimes it, it has to be the most worked out thing in the show you know it's sort of you can't get away with it being ninety percent it's got to be a hundred percent so I sometimes fight that a bit you know and, and and I still get calls very late in the day for things and say you know say oh we're doing this and all we need to do is you know the whole transformation scene of Cinderella and we, can you come in and you know we want you to do it in three hours well, right. one show I remember seeing. Um, when I was very young, was uh, The Witches. Mm. Now, Roald Dahl has... I've always believed that there should be more Roald Dahl on stage, whether yes. it be musicals or plays, because there's so many great opportunities <clears> for <throat> your work or, you know, composers or choreographers. But uh, you make a, a stage of witches disappear. Now, this was 15 years ago. Yes, uh, it's come out many times, actually, The Witches, um, probably five or six productions. This is um, David Wood, who's a brilliant writer for, and, and director for Children's Theatre. Um, I think the Times called him the, the National Treasure. Play, tra- Playwright for Children, um, which I think is, is absolutely right, and he's adapted a lot of the Roald Dahl uh, stories. Uh, it, was, it was only the second, I think it was the second show I worked on, the third show, actually. The second was uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at the RSC, um, and yeah, this, this this huge challenge of the last scene, which was um, the which is, um, I think that yeah, the, it's just it's this phenomenally difficult stage direction, I, which I recently it just memorized. Appeared, a blink of an eye. I think they, I think it's the, the witch. The witches are, 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 appear to the, the, the witches leap up onto the table. They they stiffen and appear to shrink. The, the witches are turned into mice, which which uh, scuttle everywhere and invade the restaurant. And that was the last stage direction. <laughs> And when you consider that it was a touring production and, and 10 of these witches were extras who were recruited locally uh, and had to be in this last scene. Uh, so we had to find a way of doing, doing this, staging this last scene and, and it took a long time to sort it. But the witches was a, was a great ex- experience because, again, it was a, it ha- my work has to be collaborative. If, if it's not a collaborative pro- process, then I'm, I'm dead the, in the water. With the lighting designer and set designer. Well, set, you know, and it has to be in there from the beginning and, and that was... 
the, the, the original version was designed by Susie Corker and um, who did a, designed a lot of David show David Wood shows. I think she did the BFG as well. And you know it's very important that the the methods were in there at the beginning so that there was a way of doing it. I mean we have we have her other versions. There was a, a Birmingham old rep version and a Birmingham rep production that toured around which recently was in the West End with Ruby Wax um, they've all been different versions but right? has think. you know we, we say I saw this production 15 years ago mm. has the technology evolved that you can do more effects in the show or do it differently well I think um, it all it all depends I mean it's not all my stuff is, is rarely to do with technology it's normally to do with um, good you know, it's conceiving the thing in the first place is more to do with the concept. So whenever when I've revived it, I have to say that I've tended to do the similar similar methods to the the ones that I came up with originally. It's partly because uh, there are only so many ways of doing it. There's no point in just saying, "Oh, well, I'm going to find, come up with a different way of a boy turning into a mouse." Um, if you've already found a way that really works, and one of the things on that show I remember was a was a mouse on a tightrope. Mm-hmm. One of these uh, David Wood made this list. It was called Tricky Bits, Major and Minor. And it was everything from witches having blue spit and having no toes, and the mouse, the, the witch with the snake. So how do we do the snake? And 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 um, and there was one bit where a mouse walks across a tightrope, and the solution was actually to have the mouse hanging from the tightrope underneath, and did this kind of like rather fun acrobatic thing. Speaking of Blue Peter, I actually remember seeing when they were promoting the witches back right. in ninety two. I remember seeing clips of it on Blue Peter. Well, they showed the illusion that I did. The, the, the boy changed the mouse, which which was fairly terrifying because it was done live up close, and, probably. It was, uh, but they they filmed it really really well actually, and um, but they and funny enough they had the same sequence on again in in ninety six on on, on the, from Blue Peter, but um, the, the Roald Dahl has been. I mean, there have been quite a few stage productions. I remember going in, in with Bob Crowley in in New York, uh, Los Angeles, seeing an opera of Fantastic Mr. Fox oh. that was designed by Gerald Scarf, weirdly enough. Um, but there's been no big. West End, you know, fifteen million dollar. No, I know it's surprising, of... isn't it? And I, and I think he's like his tales of the unexpected are just so brilliant. The original, Roald Dahl tales of the unexpected. I mean, you could pick many of those. Lamb in the freezer. Into, yeah, I mean, I don't know why they haven't. More of them haven't been. I mean, made but, but, but you know, there, there has a musical has been written of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Mm. Imagine designing that for the stage. Mm. I mean, that would just. Well, be of course, a... I mean, Leslie Brickers did the film again. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is. Uh, yeah, it is true. I don't know why that is. Maybe Apparently they're difficult with the rights. Yeah. Or well, Matilda has some great magic opportunities, mm. like a chalk but, flying but you in know, the air. Don't thing. you find it sometimes it's because a lot of them, because a lot of those rights have been bought up by film companies, a lot of the time it's they secure the stage rights mm. at the same time and they just hold them and they don't do anything with them. Uh, I think that's uh, certainly happened with um, Matilda, I think, yeah. um, and things like that. You know, most of them have been you know, swallowed up already, so it's probably quite an effort to get the... I think yeah, the witches would work great as a musical, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I suppose you'd have to have to have sort of gurgling children sounds <laughs> built into the soundtrack as they change into mice. It'd be fantastic! But yeah. um, thank you very, very much, Paul, for taking the time to talk to us today. And uh, you have a website, which is I do have a website, which is www.stageillusion.com, and the website for the book is. Um, I sound like I'm promoting the book. Well, I am because I'm quite proud that I've actually finally got He's it out. He's written a there. book. I've written a book, um, but it is. It had, does have a lot about the history of the magicians in it. it doesn't have any musical theatre, but uh, it, the, the website is uh, www.bloomsbury.com slash hocus pocus. We'll put a link to it from our site, musicaltalk.co.uk. And uh, thank you very, very much, Paul. And good luck with all your future musical theatre or whatever endeavours. Thank you. Do let us know. Thank you. This has been a production of Musical Talk. Copyright 2007.